I've been teaching a series for the last three weeks called Spirit, Soul, and Body, and tonight I'm going to conclude that series with a final message, and let me, let me say this, is that I'm not exhausting this topic. I could preach this topic for like the next year and, and still have material to teach on because the Bible is just full of it, and we can never, uh, I could never exhaust it, but I do want to close it because I want to move on to, to other things, and uh, the next thing that I want to uh, preach on is going to be marriage and relationships, and I don't know what the title of it's going to be yet, but I feel the Lord has put a couple different topics on my heart, and we're going to hit those, and um, part, of what, part of the vision of Life Source Church is to make disciples, amen, that should be the vision of every church, make disciples, is one thing Jesus told his body, told his church was go into all the world, teaching all nations, making disciples, and baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and lo, I'm with you always, even to the end of the world, end of the age. And so making disciples, and I felt the Lord said, I want you to make disciples spirit, soul, and body. I don't want you to just focus on the, the invisible spiritual things. I don't want you to just focus on emotional and, 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 you know, mind over matter type stuff. I don't want you just, uh, and I don't want you to just focus on the body and doing good. I want you to hit all of it, Abe, because the people that I created are triune beings, spirit, soul, and body, and they need to become discipled in every area of their life so that they can be everything they're called to be. And so that's why we've been going through spirit, soul, and body is because we are not just a body. We're not just a soul. We're not just, we are spirit, soul, and body. And uh, 1 Thessalonians 5.23 says that. It says, now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely and may your whole spirit, soul, and body be preserved blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. And so that's our key scripture for this series. And uh, just to give you a little bit of a recap, last week talked about getting the inside on the outside and how in our spirit, it's not just our spirit, it's God's spirit. When we're born again, 1 Corinthians six seventeen says that he becomes one with us and we're one in spirit with God and, and we're made righteous and truly holy and this awesome power of God that raised Christ from the dead dwells in us. And I don't know about you, but I want to figure out how to get what's on the inside out. Amen? And so we talked about that and how um, we need to first know what's inside of us in order to get it out. we got to know it's there. If you don't know it's there, you'll never get it because you don't know it's there. Ignorance is not bliss. Ignorance is powerlessness. And so you got to know it. you got to know what's in you, and you need to believe what's in you. Look at what Philemon 1.6 says. Philemon 1.6 says this. It says that the sharing of your faith may become effective. How? By the acknowledgement of every good thing which is in you in Christ Jesus. So Philemon, how do you, how, you got to acknowledge it first, and then uh, you got to believe it. And so we talked about last week how um, the th one of the things that's, that we've been given, if we, we, we've actually been given the faith of God. It's not our own human faith, our own ability to believe, but we've actually been given God's faith to believe, and it's his faith that actually causes a life transformation and, and being born again and being saved is a result of God's faith. Galatians uh, 2.16 says this, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ, even we have believed in Jesus Christ that we might be justified by the faith of Christ and not by the works of the law. For by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. And so God actually had faith in us before we put faith in him. God, God put his faith inside of us, woke us up and said, hey, use my faith to believe in me, because after all, you're dead in your trespasses and sins, and I don't know about you, but a dead person can't do much for themselves, so God had to wake us up, put his faith inside of us, and then we had to choose to exercise that faith and put it in him, and when you do that, you're born again, and you can't glory in your own works at all. It's by, by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. And so, 
Even the faith that you have to believe in God came from God. And so what is your part? What is my part? Our part is to, is to take the faith that God gives us, use our free will, and put it into God and say, God, I believe in you. I, I trust you with my life. You are the one I'm living for. And you, we put our faith that God gave us back in him, and he transforms our lives. So even the faith that we have comes from God. I love how Paul said this. And Paul, in uh, Galatians 2.20, said, I am crucified with Christ. I want you to catch the word in here. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. So not only am I saved by God's faith that he gave me, that I exercised in him, but I live every day knowing that he's living inside of me, and I live by the faith of the Son of God. I don't know about you, but I would much rather live by God's faith and let his faith operate and cause my life to flourish than try to have something in myself and live by that. And see, this is what God has given us, and yet a lot of us don't know this until we look at these scriptures like, wow, God put him, and how, how, is this, how is this possible? Because when he comes into our life, he is in us by the Holy Spirit. So you have God's righteousness in your spirit, God's holiness in your spirit, God's faith in your spirit, God's vision in your spirit, God's ideas in your spirit. We need to tap into who he is in our lives and how he, what he has put inside of us, and this is what... This is what the Bible, this is what Christian maturity is all about, is growing up in him, finding who we are in him, and living it out in our daily lives. And so he gave us our, he gave us our faith. This is all recap from last week, and ways to exercise our faith. And you can go online and listen to these at uh, lifesourcebuildings.org, but I just, I said we must become single-minded. We have to we got to be single-minded. You can go online and listen to that and understand what that means. But single-minded, a lot of us are double-minded, and we're unstable in all our ways. And don't let, don't let any man believe that he's going to get anything of God if he's double-minded, James 1 says. And so we got to be single-minded. We've got to study God's Word. Um, we got to get his word inside of us. His word is his word is not ink just ink on a page. It's Jesus said the words that I speak unto you John 6:63, 6, they're spirit and they're life and if you take them in, they will transform you and you'll actually know who you are in Christ. And then the third thing was praying in tongues. Praying in tongues is an awesome tool that God has given us to help us uh, to help our spirit overtake our soul and let us live more out of the spirit instead of the flesh. And then the last thing was we just got to step out. There's just no substitute for actually doing what Nike said. Just do it. Just live it. Go out there and try it out. And uh, believe that God has put himself inside of you and that he wants to manifest himself through your life. So tonight, um, I want to conclude this with this message entitled, Present Your Body, Renew Your Mind. Spirit, soul, and body, present your body, renew your mind. And the scripture that I want to launch out of is Romans 12, 1 and 2. It says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren and sistren, <laughs> by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Present your body, renew your mind. We've talked a lot about the spirit. We've talked a lot about the soul. I've referenced the body here and there, but we're going to hit the body here. And what is your body? What is this body, you know, and for those of you that have been part of the series, you're already in on all the answers, you know already what it is, your body is the vehicle that God has given you to get around on planet earth you are not your body you have a body, but you are not your body, you are a spirit everybody say, I'm a spirit I have a soul and I live in a body your body is your vehicle that God has given you to get around on planet Earth. 
And if you don't have a body, you can't be here. Body, your body is very important. And so um, your body is your, your physical part. It's your vehicle. And let me say this. Your body is actually the thing that makes you legal. It's the key word legal to operate on earth. You can't, you can't do what Genesis 1, 26 and 7 says and be fruitful, multiply and take dominion unless you have a body. And that's part of what God has called us as human beings, and we cannot legally operate that way without a body. In fact, if you don't have a body, um, like I said, you can't operate on the earth. There's a principle. Spirits, which that's what you and I are, that's what God is. John 4, 24 says God is spirit, and we are spirits who have souls who lives in bo- live in bodies. Spirits are illegal to operate or to have dominion and power on the earth without a body. You see, spirits can influence on the earth, but only humans were given dominion on the earth. And not to dig into it too deep, but a human being is a complicated thing. A human being, I like how Miles Monroe says it. He says that human is made up of two words, humus, which refers to the dirt, humus, And man is a spirit being. And so a human is a combination of humus man or dirt, a a, a spirit being in a dirt body. And so a human is an amazing creature where God made a dirt body and placed a spirit inside of him and said, human beings can have dominion and be fruitful and multiply, Genesis 126. They're made in his likeness and in his image, and they're called to have dominion. But spirits cannot do that unless you have a body. They can influence, but they cannot function without bodies on this planet in dominion. And so spirits can have power in the air, in the atmosphere, without bodies, but they can't have power and dominion on the earth. That's why Satan is called the prince of the power Not of the earth, but of the air. And when he was cast to this earth, he was actually cast to the air that surrounds the earth. (laughs) And this is getting into some things that um, I'd have to take another, you know, message or two or three or four and explain. But let me just let me just give you this: that uh, you know, Ephesians two two says that we were once children of disobedience. And uh, part, you know, ruled by the prince of the power of the air. And Ephesians 6, 12 says this, For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness. Where? In heavenly places, in high places. And so, spirits, demons, angels, these kinds of things, which demons were angels that rebelled against God and became uh, reprobate, became evil with the devil and were cast out of heaven to this earth. And they are trying, this is why they want to get into human beings and get into bodies because their power is limited until they access a body. That's why they're trying to influence and motivate with fear so that if we can give in, we can give them power to have access on the earth. When Jesus calmed the storm and made his way from one end of the lake of Gennesaret over to the other, to the land of the Gadarenes, he came in contact with a man that was possessed with demons. You remember this story? A legion of demons and he was cutting himself with stones, self-mutilization, and all this stuff, running around naked in the tombs, and nobody could bind him. He had chains, and he would snap them and break them. He had super, it was, he was demon-possessed, and he had supernatural power. And when Jesus comes over, the demons cry out and say, uh, you know, Jesus, don't, you know, don't cast us into the abyss. But look at what Matthew chapter 8, 31 says. It says, so the demons begged him, saying, if you cast us out, permit us to go away into the herd of swine. Give us a body at least. Because 
if you do any more study on this kind of topic, Jesus said in Matthew 12, 43, that when an unclean spirit goes out of a man, he goes through dry places seeking rest but finds none. You see, demons are, are, are tormented in their disembodied cast out state they're not they didn't keep their first estate they were cast out and they are looking for rest trying to find somebody to take up residence in because that's how they can find a little bit of peace and so they're influencing trying to motivate by fear and if i can get jesus don't cast us out of this at least give us the pigs to enter into you see they understand this whole thing that they need a body and um, I'm, I'm telling you all this so that we can understand the, the need and the importance of our bodies and why we need to take care of them and why it's important what we put into them and what we look at with them and what we hear with them and what we ingest with them and what we surround ourselves with. It's not just, yeah, take care of your body, you're a Christian. No, this is like serious supernatural stuff that... There are, there's a whole spirit realm that is more real than our natural realm, and it is trying to influence and gain ground, and, he, and that darkness wants to use your body. But here's the good news, is that God wants to use your body too. After all, he is a spirit as well. And part of the way God created this planet was Genesis 1, 26 and 7. He said, let them have dominion. He gave dominion to human beings, spirit, spirits in dirt bodies, and God said, let them have dominion, and he took himself out of the equation. He is God overall, but he also never breaks his word. And so when he sets up something, he operates within that structure. And so he gave dominion to Adam. How else did Adam uh, fall and give give the give dominion over to Satan because he had the power to surrender it, just like you and I. Now that Jesus has won back the kingdom, won back the authority, and made us uh, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ, and He has indwelt us with the Holy Spirit, we have the ability to take up the dominion that God has given us, or we can surrender it based on what we do with our bodies. So your body's important. If a spirit is going to get anything done, exercise authority on this earth, it has to be in a body. That's why Satan didn't just come to Eve in the garden as Satan. He talked to the serpent and said, hey, I'm going to use your body. And he got access through a body. If God is going to get something done on the earth, he always goes through human beings. He does. You look at it in the Old Covenant, in the Old Testament. Adam, tend the garden. Well, God, why don't you just supernaturally tend the garden? Because you are the one I put in charge. <laughs> Noah, well, God, can't you just woo people into a boat and just scoop them up in your arms? No, Noah, you build a boat, and you, your three sons, your wife, and, and, and your, your son's three wives, you eight righteous people come into the ark, and I'm going to, save the world, and I'm going to use you. Why didn't God just circumvent humanity? Because he's so true to his word that he will not violate his word. He uses human beings to do the works that he needs to do on this planet because we have bodies, because we're human beings. Abraham, God wants to make a covenant with mankind. Well, why can't just God do it by himself? He needs he needs somebody on the earth that he's given legal access to to make a covenant with, to bring. I mean, when God wanted to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah, why didn't he just, like, do it? But he went through Abraham. He said, Abraham, should I do this? Does that ever just strike you as odd that God is consulting with the human being on whether or not to judge a city? I mean, he's God. But why is this? It's because God wants to have fellowship with human beings, and he has, it's absolutely necessary in order to play out the, the, the plan of God on this earth. God doesn't just, well, you're just a human being. You're just another one of the 7 billion people on the planet. No, he wants you. He needs you in order to function in your role on planet earth. And if nobody does it, if nobody does, does what you do, nobody will do it. I remember I was in my shower one morning taking a shower 
um, before we started the church, and I felt the Lord say to me, um, Abe, if you don't do what I'm calling you to do, certain people's freedom will not be released upon them if you don't act. <laughs> I always have a hard time recounting it because it wasn't audible. It was like, Abe, if you don't step into your position, neither will anybody else. And it was like, as, it was as though me fitting into the plan of God actually activated others to fit into their plan. And I thought about it for a moment, and I was like, Lord, that, 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 that thing, that, I think I'm thinking too highly of myself, Lord. Forgive me. I'm, I'm sorry. I'm just a worm. And this is, this is all, you know, that's, that was my mindset at the time. And then I went to the Word, and I got understanding. And I'm like, you know what? I went to my pastor at the time. I said, this is what I feel like I heard from the Lord, but it just seems odd. And he said, yeah, absolutely, Abe. If you don't do what you're called to do, the people that you're supposed to affect will never be affected because you're not stepping into what you were called to do. And our lives make a difference whether or not we say yes to God or we say, you know what, God will find somebody else. I'm good. And so we have a, a, a plan that God, that God wants to fulfill in our lives, and he has to use us. Moses, he used Moses. He used the prophets. He used the judges. He used Deborah, both men and women alike, boys and girls, Samuel. Everybody, he's looking for human beings, spirits in dirt bodies to get stuff done on the earth because we're the ones who have legal access and authority to do it. So Mary and Joseph. Mary, I want to birth myself into humanity. Why? Because I'm a spirit and I can't operate on that planet unless I've got a body. You want to give me a body? Let it be done unto me as your word has said. And she opened herself up, and, and God became a man, and the whole incarnation is because God's word is set up and dominion was set up so that human beings would be the ones who legally operate on the earth. And God said, if I'm going to save humanity, I can't save them up here being a spirit. I have to become one of them. And so he came, the word became flesh, John 1.14, and dwelt among us because he had to. St. Augustine said this, without God, man cannot, without God, man cannot, and without man, God will not. John Wesley said this about prayer, in prayer, I learned that without God, I cannot, and without me, God will not. Is that thinking too highly of yourself? No, that's taking the word of God and saying, I'm going to step up to my rightful place, and God thinks more highly of me. You know what? There are people that are arrogant, and um, I don't know if chauvinistic is the right word. I'm not that smart. But, um, you know, that are boastful and, and prideful. There are people like that, and they're wrong. Self-righteousness is filthy rags before God. It's, it, God resists the proud but gives grace to the humble. But I tell you, a humble person reads the word of God and says, God, if you said it, I believe it. That settles it. This is who I am. This is who you've made me, and I believe that. To believe God's word is not to be prideful when he says that, that he needs us, he wants us. That's to think soberly based on the word of God that, that this is the truth. And so you're not elevating yourself or thinking of yourself more highly than you, than you ought. You're thinking of yourself right. And I don't know about you, but most people in this world think of themselves way lowly. And they think, I'm just another protoplasm that washed up on the beach. And, you know, it's probably you know, the more of me that you get rid of, the better. You know, people are dealing with self-esteem issues and rejection and hurt and brokenness. And you know, my family didn't want me and this and that. God wants you. God sees every single human being worth the blood of Jesus Christ, and he went through everything he went through to redeem you. Why? Because he's got a plan for your life, and, and you are the only person that can get done what you can do <laughs> and get done by the power and spirit of God. And your environment is perfect for God working in it. So let me show you a scripture. Hebrews 10, 4 through 5 says this. For it is not possible that the blood of bulls and goats could take away sins. Therefore, when he, talking about Jesus, when he came into the world, he said, Sacrifice and offering you did not desire, but a body you have prepared for me. <laughs> he needed a body to get the job done. 
And then when Jesus on the Last Supper, instituting the new covenant in his blood, he said in Luke twenty two nineteen, he took the bread, gave thanks, broke it, gave it to them saying, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. You see, it was Christ's body that was the means through which God redeemed humanity. There's no body of Christ. There's no broken body so that we could be healed and made right with God. It's all through the body. Well, I don't need to take care of my body as long as I read my Bible and worship and go to church. You know, I mean, no, <laughs> your body is incredibly important. And your body doesn't belong to you either. You've been loaned your body. You see, everything we have has been given to us by God. Even the, the firing brain waves that are going on in my brain and your brain right now for me to communicate and for you to hear and understand was given to us by God. And we ought to praise him for everything he's given us because what did a man ever have that he did not receive? There's no self-made men. There's no self-made women. God has made us. He has endued us. He has given us. And that's why we worship. That's why we give. That's why we live our lives is for the glory of God. So our bodies are extremely important. I love this. I'm just going to, can I just share with you a couple? I'm, I'm sharing with you scriptures. This is what I do. John 4, uh, I, let me go this. Let me do, uh, oh, I got so much. John 14, 16 through 17. I think you guys are getting the point. And I will pray the Father, Jesus said, and he will give you another helper that he may abide with you forever, the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him for he dwells with you and will be in you. <laughs> See, Jesus made a way for God to gain access legally again into, the, into humanity. He made a way for us to be reunited with God. That's what redemption is all about, is God coming back into humanity and renewing, Titus 3.5, the Holy Ghost. Renewing, putting it back, making it new again, putting it back to day one in the garden, walking and talking with God. That's how we can live. Why don't we, Abe? Well, we don't know about it. <laughs> A lot of us don't know about it. We don't, and then, of course, we don't believe in it because we don't know about it. And then isn't it just all one day, pie in the sky type thing? To put the, no, it's here and now. When Jesus said, when you pray, pray, thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. These kinds of things are laced throughout the Bible. Why? Because God is on a mission to bring us back into reunion with God. And he redeemed us by his blood and by his broken body. And then, guess what? He not only sent he not only came in bodily form and gave his body to be broken, but when he ascended into heaven, he left his body here. <laughs> here we are. <laughs> he left his body here, and he said, occupy till I come. Continue to do what I've called you to do. He left his body here. So... Our opening scripture, Romans 12, 1, I beseech you. That word means I urge you, I implore you, I call you out aloud. I'm begging with you. It's the strongest language in the Greek. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to him, to God, which is your reasonable service. It's reasonable to say, here, God, Take what you have bought, what you have paid for, what you have given, what you have loaned me. It's absolutely reasonable to, to present myself back to you and my body and say, have my body. <laughs> it's a spiritual act of worship, the NIV says. You see, your body and your spirit are connected. And it connects when you yield it to God. So... That's our body. You need your body. It's important. Everybody is a somebody. <laughs> Everybody. God needs us. He loves us. My brain is exploding in my head right now, but <laughs> it's good. 
It feels good. <laughs> so, as important as your, as your body is, your soul is even more so. Because your soul, your mind, your will, and your emotions, your heart, your personality is your life's determining factor. You see, your soul is your second part of spirit, soul, and body. And wherever your soul goes, whatever your soul wants to do, your body will follow. Last week, I brought up three individuals, and I showed you how the soul is in the middle, and your soul is the, is the part of you that is between your spirit and your body. And whatever comes through your body interacts with your soul, and then your soul takes it to your spirit. Is this righteous? Is this not? If you're born again, your spirit is righteous and truly holy. And if you take into your soul that which is not holy, you will have this war going on in your own mind. And Joyce Meyer titled it perfectly, The Battlefield of the Mind, because where's your mind at? But it's in your soul. And when you have this conflict going on where your soul is saying, but it feels good, but your spirit's going, it's not good, but it feels good, it's not good. You have to align your soul to the word of God, which is congruent with the spirit of God inside of you. The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. And so when we align our soul, our thinking, our mind, will, and emotions to the way God thinks, then we're in alignment with our spirit, and then that which is truly holy can come out into our flesh and be manifest and God who's in you the hope of glory can be seen for all the world to see and it's a matter of renewing our mind and so our soul is uh, as our soul goes our life goes our body is the gateway to our soul and whatever or whoever controls our soul controls our life Again, Romans 12, 1 and 2, let me read it again. It says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. Verse 2, and do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed. How? By the renewing of your mind. Your mind is in your soul. That you may prove that which, uh, what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. He says, don't be conformed anymore. That word means to be pressed into the mold of the patterns of this world. But be transformed, which is the, the Greek word metamorpho, which, which means metamorphosize, like a caterpillar into a butterfly. Be changed into a brand new way of thinking by the renewing of your mind. And th so that you can prove that which is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. That word prove means so that you can experientially test and experience the amazing will of God. How do you test and experience the amazing will of God? You renew your mind by the word of God, transforming your soul, not being conformed to this world, and then you'll be able to see the things that the scripture talks about manifesting in your life. It's just, it's what what this is all about. This is spiritual maturity. Your spirit isn't getting any mature. It's that you're aligning more to your already mature spirit. Your soul, your way of thinking, your mind, your will, and emotions are being aligned by the word of God. But if we align our soul to the natural way of thinking, to what the Bible calls our carnal mind, then it only brings forth death. Romans 8, 5 says this, For they that are after the flesh, they that are after the flesh, in other words, they who think according to an unregenerate, this is the way every man does it, we live by our senses, if I don't see it, taste it, touch it, smell it, hear it, it's not real, if I'm not feeling it, I'm not feeling it, I'm not going to do it. If, I, if you live that way, for they that are after the flesh, they do mind the things of the flesh. But they that are after the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. And so the whole goal is to get that carnal mind which is in you until it is renewed to be a spiritual mind. <laughs> and uh, somebody says, you know, well... 
if it's natural, you know, if I have a natural mind, isn't, you know, we live in a day and age where everyone wants natural food, natural bread, natural, you know, natural's good, right? You know, natural won't hurt you. Well, there's some things that are natural that'll hurt you. You know, like mercury's natural, you know, very natural, but <laughs> very bad for you to drink, lethal, right? Things that are natural are not always good. Something that just comes naturally to you. It's just, some, it's just the way I was born. You know, it just comes natural. Not everything that's natural is good. <laughs> I mean, there's so many ridiculous examples. Like rocks are natural. But I can think of plenty of ways to use a rock in a natural way that will bring great destruction. <laughs> you know, water's natural, but not in your lungs. <laughs> Air is natural, but not in your blood stream, an embolism, rising too fast when you're deep sea diving, that kind of thing. <laughs> we don't do that in Montana, but, <laughs> you know, this, like, just because it's natural does not, well, this is just the way I was born. So, it's wrong. If it's not aligned with the word of God, well, I just have these natural feelings. So, natural will kill you if it's not aligned with God's word. You see, we're, our natural mind brings death. Well, everyone's doing it. I mean, society, we voted on it, and, you know, they passed it, and it's, it's, it's probably right, you know, because after all, the majority is right. No, you know, the majority at one time believed the earth was flat. And the majority believed at one time that heavier objects uh, uh, fell faster than lighter objects in a vacuum. They thought if it weighed more, then it fell faster, but they both fall at the same time. The majority has been wrong over and over and over again. The majority of Germany thought that the Holocaust was a good thing back in 1937. The majority is often wrong over and over and over again. And so don't just go with the flow. Well, it's just natural. No. There are things that are natural that are na they're natural because Adam fell into sin and he produced sons and daughters in a fallen state and they produce themselves over and over and over again and just like copies of copies of copies of copies on a printer and on a Xerox machine, every copy got a little bit more faded and a little bit worse until it was not like the original image that they were created to be. And so just because it's natural doesn't mean it's healthy. And just because it's second nature to you doesn't mean it came from God either. Well, that's just how I react to things. That's just who I am. You know, I'm just kind of a jumpy, quick, to judge type of uh, angry person, you know? I mean, leave me alone. You know, it's fine that you're full of joy and you see the bright side of everything, but I just, you know, I'm a realist, you know? <clears throat> what you mean is you don't read the Bible, and you don't submit to the Bible, and you don't want the Bible in your life. So, <laughs> be honest. Amen. Thank you for finishing that thought. <laughs> Absolutely. That's the truth. And so, just because it comes second nature to you, I mean, I can, I can spin a basketball on my finger, and it comes second nature to me. I can go between my, I mean, I can... I can do a lot of things that are second nature. Why? Because I practiced it, and I was taught it, and I repeated it over and over and over again. You know, before you're born again, and even some of you that are born again, you're, you've been practicing things from the day you were born that were wrong, that are second nature to you, not because they're in you, because God wants them in you, but because you've been taught that, you've, been, you've heard the mantra, you have practiced it over and over again, you've built a foundation on it, and it is so like a part of you but it's not lined up with the word of God. And it brings death in your life. And so when you become born again, your spirit becomes righteous and truly holy, Ephesians 4.24. And who you are in the spirit is awesome and just like God in your spirit. But the carnal mind, which is in your soul, has to be renewed by the word of God or else your life will look no different than an unregenerated lost person. Because as your soul goes, so goes your life. And whatever you're feeding your soul, that is going to manifest itself in your life. So, what do you bring in through your eyes, your ears? I tell you, if you want to get it deep into your soul, 
repeat it over and over again. Practice it, practice it, practice it. And that which is, goes into your ears, your eyes, your body will deposit into your soul and you'll create either a good stronghold or a bad stronghold. But it'll be a stronghold either way. And we got to make sure that we're doing it according to God's word. Let me show you just a, a little picture here. Ken, oh, did, did I email? I emailed you an image, but I didn't, I didn't tell you about it. You know what? We're going to skip it. But there's two parts to your mind, and one part is called your, um, well, there's two parts to your natural mind. One's called your conscious mind. One's called your subconscious mind. Have you heard of this? Your conscious mind, your subconscious mind? In other words, um, there are certain things you don't have to think about doing. They just happen by themselves. Things like your bodily functions, um, um, you know, even predispositions to you encounter somebody, you have automatic thoughts that you don't have to think about. Those are subconscious things. And we're going to be having, you know, I think tomorrow is the Super Bowl, right? Tomorrow Sunday? Okay. On Super Bowl Sunday, companies spend millions and millions of dollars in order to advertise to get things deposited into your conscious mind first but then if they can repeat it with billboards and flashy things and this over here, and they do it from the age of zero all the way till 15 to 16, and they're just constantly flashing their image, their sign, what they got for you, what goes into your eyes and ears, they are hoping that by repetition and practice can get it into your subconscious mind so that when you walk the aisle, it's no competition as to whose product you're going to buy. You're going to get theirs because after all, they've invested millions and millions of dollars to try to do that. And so I think I read a statistic about this. This is, you know, for this Super Bowl tomorrow, um, this year's Super Bowl host network, CBS, is charging a record $5.25 million for just a 30-second spot. That's $175,000 per second. Either they are completely out of their gourd <laughs> or they know something that we don't know. You know, is that worth spending that much money? If you can create a customer and create a lifelong customer that's going to spend so many thousands of dollars and multiply that by 300 million people in the United States or 7 billion in the world, that's a drop in the bucket. Because our world understands that if we can get to the soul of human beings, if we can get into their conscious mind and hit it enough, enough, enough to where it deposits in the subconscious mind, they don't even have to think twice to grab Doritos. They don't even have to think twice to get whatever. Potato tips, yeah. They're going to take my brand. I'm telling you, it works. And so the same thing is true in a positive light. And you know what? And marketers aren't evil people. They're just brilliant, <laughs> you know? And, uh, you know, I think Jesus said, you know, the children of this world are wiser in their age than the children of light. We're the children of light. We need to grow in our wisdom and understanding sometimes. But, uh, you know, the same is true in a positive sense, that if we, by habit and repetition, and continue reading the Word of God, why do you keep reading that same book over and over again? Because this is the words of life, and if I can get it into me, and if I can understand it, and if I can hammer it into me, I will become what I behold. And that's true either way. And so I'm going after, me personally, I'm going after God, and I want to have everything he has for me. And yet I know in my life there was a lot of strongholds and a lot of things in my soulless realm that needed to be uprooted and just disposed of because they were only bringing forth death in my life. You have an addiction? Is it because you've practiced it over and over again? Well, yeah. If you cut off the source, you have to cut off the source. Jesus said, if your hand offends you, cut it off. If your eye offends you, gouge it out and cast it from you. It's better to enter life maimed than to have your whole body and be thrown into hell. What he's, he's not talking about self-mutilization. Don't anybody go, you know, don't, don't anybody cut your hand off or gouge your eye. What he's saying is remove the source. Get it out of your life. 
that thing that you've been doing over and over again and bringing into your body is, is causing that to be a reality in your life. It's directing your whole life. But if your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. What does that mean? That means throw your computer up. That means get rid of it. That means put, put, be accountable and have everything you, you look at on your phone and everything visible to somebody you trust so that you don't stumble. In the, I mean, I'm bringing, up, I'm bringing up the sins of lust and everything because that is the biggest one in our society today. And it's killing people. It's killing marriages. It's destroying families. It's infiltrating the church, and pastors are being, are being removed and, and found out and all this stuff. And I'll tell you what. I live in a glass house, and I'm proud to say that because my wife, everything that I own that connects to the Internet and everything that connects to the Internet life source-wise is monitored by multiple people so that if anything ever happens, we're in a glass house because we don't want anything to bring the evil into what God is doing in his body. See, this, we're his body. We're his body. And the way we corporately think and the, what we corporately bring in affects the way people live. And I'm just, my heart, my heart was breaking this, uh, this, uh, this week, um, knowing people that are just going through the throes of, of evil because they've allowed things habitually into their lives and it's caused stronghold and, and, and uh, just great devastation. And so we need to get this. Proverbs 4.23 says this, keep your heart, guard your heart with all diligence. Where's your heart at? It's in your soul. You see, whatever goes into your conscious deposits into your subconscious, which goes into your heart. Your heart, not your blood pumping muscle, but the center of who you are. What's the center of who you are? Well, you got your body on the outside and your spirit on the inside. Your soul is right in the center. So what you bring in through your eyes, your ears, your body goes into your, your conscious, subconscious, deposits in your heart. The Bible says keep your heart with all diligence. Why? For out of it spring the issues of life. Jesus said in Matthew 15, 19, for out of the heart proceed evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, fornications, thefts, false witness, blasphemies. All or these are the things which defile a man. But to eat with unwashed hands, that <laughs> doesn't defile a man. See, they were so focused on the outward that they forgot about the bitterness that was in their heart, the rage, the anger, the lust, the, the I want to steal this from somebody. I want to cheat my way out of taxes this year. I'm gonna, you know, all that stuff is in their heart. And he said, you got to get that out. That's defiling you. Don't worry about washing your hands. You know what? Eat, 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 your, food. eat your food after your dog licks your hands as, as far as I'm concerned. Just get that stuff out of your heart that's in your heart. <laughs> okay? So guard your heart with all diligence. I have so much to say. I'm not going to say it all. I just love how the, old, how the Old Covenant, Jesus, well, God, God is, Jesus is God. God in the Old Covenant, he would say this phrase to the children of Israel. He said, circumcise your hearts. What is circumcision? Well, don't tell me. I know what it is. <laughs> but here's what it is. Circumcision is removing flesh. That's what it is. Removing a fleshly mindset. Removing, circumcise your hearts, God would tell his people. Don't be stiff-necked. Circumcise, if there's flesh, let me remove. And who, 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 who circumcises the children? The child, I should say, in our, in our, okay, I'm asking rhetorical questions. <laughs> Here's who does it. <laughs> fathers do parents do parents are the ones that say you know when a male child is born if you do that you know you don't have to do that but if you do that um the doctor doesn't do anything without the parent saying whether or not it happens so what's the type and shadow there you are the ones as parents if you're a parent that helps your child remove the flesh out of their lives and become who the, everything they've been called to be circumcise their hearts and you as a parent and as an adult God has done an amazing work in making us righteous and truly holy in our spirits and now he says Peter said on the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2 after they had received the Holy Ghost and 
speaking in tongues in this whole pandemonium of awesomeness and 3,000 being added to the church and all that. And Peter rises up to the saved people and he says, now save yourselves from this perverse and untoward generation. I thought they were just, I thought they were saved already, Peter. Well, they are in their spirit, but he needs, the, he, God, God wants to sanctify us, save us, spirit, soul, and body, and preserve us blameless on the day of Jesus Christ. And so you're saved, but you're being saved, and one day you're going to be saved. And that's what salvation means. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's an event, it's a lifestyle, and a future fulfillment. And God wants to save those who are being saved. That's us. And he wants to renew us in everything he's called us to. And so our body's important. It's impossible. I'm just going to wrap this up here tonight. It's impossible to live the Christian life. By living in the flesh, you have to live in the spirit. You have to live according to what the spirit of God is doing. Things like forgiveness. Jesus said, if a man offends you seven, Peter, Peter said, you know, what should I do if um, somebody offends me seven times, my brother offends me seven times, should I forgive him up to seven times? And Jesus says, not up to seven times, but 70 times seven. All right, 490. All right, I can do that. No, it's not what he's talking about. He's saying endless. You forgive all the time. You, there is never a point in time when you don't forgive. I don't know about you, but that's impossible in the flesh. I mean, if somebody wrongs you once in the morning, you know, at 8 in the morning, and then at 9, and then at 10, and they say they're sorry, and then 11, 11, 15, 11, I mean, they're just constant. How in the world can you operate in forgiveness if you're not operating in the Spirit? But you see, what operating in the Spirit is, is you see past their flesh, and you see into their heart, and you see who God created them to be, even though they lost sight of it, and you see beyond them, and you see, and you call out the man or woman of God inside of them and say, you know what? It's all right. Or I forgive you. Don't say it's all right. Sometimes it's not all right, but you say, I forgive you. Sometimes it's very, very wrong, but you say, I forgive you. Why? Because Christ has forgiven me of everything I've ever done, and I don't have to stand at his judgment seat and answer for what I've what, all, the, all the sins that I did in my, in my life. He's washed me by his blood. And because he did that, I can say, I forgive you. Of course, I don't hold it against you. I love you. I see who you were created to be. And here's who you were created to be. You lost sight of it. But let me tell you who you are. You're a man of God. You're a woman of God. You're lost right now. But God's drawing you back to himself. Living in forgiveness, living in love, you can't do unless you are living in the spirit. Love bears all things, it believes all things, it hopes all things, endures all things. You can't do it unless you're living in the spirit. But if you're living according to the flesh, your love can be bought, it can be sold, it can be negotiated. If, if you give me, I give you. My love's conditional, all this kinds of stuff. But we're not called to live in the flesh. We're called to live in the spirit. One last scripture, I promise you. Matthew twenty-two thirty-seven. 37. All comes down to this. Jesus said to them, they asked him, what's the greatest commandment, Jesus? You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. Heart, soul, and mind are all in the same. What's he saying? He's saying, love me with your soul. Love me with your soul. Love me with that part of you that needs to be renewed in the spirit of your mind. Love me. He's being redundant. Love me with all your heart, soul, and mind. Those are all contained in the soul. (laughs) So your body is extremely important. God needs your body. Your soul dictates where your body goes. So love God with everything you are, everything you have, everything you hope to be. If we do that, we'll grow up in Christ. And we'll see his kingdom come and his will be done in this earth as it is in heaven. That's all I have tonight. (laughs) That's it, I promise you.